Hello and welcome to another lecture on our way to understanding the role of semiconductors in electronic devices and specifically their use in very large scale integrated circuits. Today we're going to talk about how there are a lot of electrons in a semiconductor and those electrons need to be put into states. States in a semiconductor are depicted entirely by their energy and so I've sketched this number line on the screen depicting energies from low to high and little horizontal dashed lines that separate those energies into bins. And there's a certain number of states per energy bin, and as you get to higher energies, you get more and more states in each bin. These circles depict available states. Now these are available states, these are not electrons. Think of a state as a house. An electron might be a person in the house, so you could have a lot more houses than you have people. And there are only so many houses where somebody's home. And we can depict an occupied state by filling in these empty states. So that lowest energy state has an electron occupying it. Now electrons will fill the lowest available states before they move up. It's the energy minimum principle that governs how things work in physics. So if there are a whole bunch of electrons, there are going to be a whole bunch of filled states. And let me depict that. So there are enough electrons in our hypothetical semiconductor to fill up the three lowest energy bins. So with each bin having the same size delta E, there's an increasing number of states in each bin. And so there's a function that describes the number of states in each bin called the density of states. And there's a function that describes the probability that each bin is occupied so the number of states at each energy level is called the density of states, and it's the number of states per unit energy, where a unit of energy is delta E. Energy is given in electron volts in our semiconductor course. That's our density of states function, D of E. Let's go back to the idea of nobody being home, and let's call F of E the probability that a state is occupied at energy E. So E is the height along this axis. Wherever you are, you have a certain probability that states are occupied. We'll give it a name first. This function, F of E, is the Fermi-Dirac distribution. The next thing we have to do is put an expression into it. The value of F of E is between 0 and 1 because it's a probability. It will never exceed 1 and it will never be negative. Now see if you follow this reasoning. If D of E is the number of states in each one of these bins, and F of E is the probability that a state is occupied, then the product of the number of states times the probability of occupation must tell you how many electrons there are. Just the product D of E times F of E should tell you how many electrons there are per span of energy delta E. So if D of E is the number of states per unit energy, the product D of E times delta E should just be the number of states. So let's write it like this. D of E times delta E is the number of states available times F of E, the probability that an electron is in that state. The product is the number of electrons that this bin has at energy E. The bin is size delta E. And just put words on what each one of these parentheses means. D of E delta E is the number of states in the bin. And F of E is the fraction of states that are occupied. So the sum of the density of states, D of E, times the bin size, which gives you the number of states in each bin, times the fraction of those states that are occupied, summed up over all of the bins, gives you all of the electrons in the bulk semiconductor. You should recognize this as perhaps an integral. If I take the limit as delta E gets very small, I can replace that summation sign with an integral sign. And I have the integral of this D of E function times this F of E function, both of which still need to be worked out, integrated over energy. And that's the total number of electrons in that sample of conductive material. So let's annotate this final expression with what these things are. D of E, the density of states function, 
DOS, and f of e is the Fermi Dirac distribution, which we will normally refer to as the Fermi function. The Fermi Dirac distribution is described functionally as 1 divided by 1 plus the exponential of energy minus something called the Fermi energy divided by kT. k is Boltzmann's constant, the product kT at room temperature is 0 0.0259 electron volts. E sub f is called the Fermi energy, also in electron volts. I think it's important to understand what the Fermi energy is, and to do that we'll need to make a picture of this function. Before doing that, we need to look at limiting values. So when energy is zero, the Fermi function goes to one, because it's one divided by one plus e to the minus. Okay, a typical Fermi energy might be around one electron volt. So that exponential is going to be a large negative power when energy equals zero. You therefore have one divided by one plus zero. When the energy equals the Fermi energy, quite simply that ends up being 1 over 1 plus 1, 1 half. And when the energy gets very large, E becomes very large, it becomes very much larger than the Fermi energy, then you have 1 divided by 1 plus E to a large positive number, and so it's 0. So we have these limiting values at large and small energies, and at the Fermi energy, I think we can take a guess at what this looks like, or you could put it into your graphing calculator and find out too, using a made-up value of one electron volt for the Fermi energy, and you find that it looks like this. Kind of like a step function, but rounded. The important thing is that it passes through a value of one half at the Fermi energy. One thing I would note about this function is that when the energy is larger than the Fermi energy, there isn't much function left. It goes to zero fairly quickly because you have one plus e to a large negative power. However, if the temperature is zero, meaning that this denominator in the exponent is very small, this function is going to take on a more intriguing form. It sort of looks like a step function right now because at low energy, it's just one throughout this whole low energy region. And you have to get close to the Fermi energy for this exponential in the denominator to start to have an impact on the value of the function. But when temperature is zero, this exponential is either e to the infinity, in the event that e is greater than e Fermi, or e to the minus infinity, in the event that e is less than e Fermi. And so when energy is less than e Fermi, this exponential is zero because it's e to the minus infinity. But when energy is greater than e Fermi, this exponential blows up, and so the Fermi function goes to zero. And so at zero temperature, it's a true step function. At higher temperatures, you get this rounding, and by room temperature, some fairly noticeable rounding. But it's still a fairly small rounding over the whole range of available energies. So here's my take on the physical meaning of the Fermi energy. The electrons in the semiconductor start filling up the lowest energy states and they fill up and up and up until you run out of electrons. The Fermi energy is at the top, so you can say the Fermi energy is the top of the sea of electrons. The electrons are like a fluid in a bucket or an ocean, and the Fermi energy is sea level. So that's how I would describe it. It is the top of the sea of electrons. It's the maximum energy state that an electron can occupy at zero temperature. So as you elevate the temperature, you can start to see electrons at a higher energy. Again, we might think about water analogy. If I have a bucket full of water, there's the top of the water, that's sea level. But as you raise temperature, molecules evaporate. They get enough thermal energy that they can fly into the air. And so you have water molecules above the top. That's kind of what happens with the electrons in a conductive material. As you give them temperature, they evaporate into the conduction region. Now I'm going to do a couple of examples. The first one is theoretical, and the second one uses numbers. So in the first example, what becomes of the Fermi function when the energy minus Fermi energy is large? That's basically saying the energy is large, right? E minus E Fermi is much larger than what's in the denominator of that exponent. What becomes of the Fermi energy? So we look at that exponential that's in the denominator of the Fermi function, e to the minus 
energy minus E Fermi over KT, that becomes very large. So how would we simplify the Fermi function? There's the Fermi function. And that exponential has become very large. It's much larger than 1, so you can ignore this 1, in other words. And if you ignore that 1, you have a simplified expression, which you might simplify a little more by bringing the exponential upstairs. That's what becomes the Fermi function at high energy. Quite frequently, it's factored into two exponents so that you have a constant term, e to the e Fermi over kt, and you have a variable term, e to the minus energy over kt, because Fermi energy is just a number, characteristic of the system. This factor, e to the minus energy over kt, goes by the statistical mechanical name of Boltzmann factor, and you might recognize this e to the minus energy over kt from statistical mechanics. I think you want to save this expression either, in either form, divided out, split into two exponentials, or written as one, because we're going to use that a lot from now on for the Fermi function. The second example uses some numbers. If I have a Fermi energy of 1 electron volt and an electron of 1.6 electron volts, and I'm at room temperature, what is the value of the Fermi function? It's a very short calculation. I already have it up here. So we'll use our newfound simplification, e to the energy minus e Fermi over kt, and I'll put those numbers in, and I get 10 to the minus 10. So the probability that a state that's 0.6 electron volts above the Fermi energy is occupied at room temperature is 10 to the minus 10, or 10 to the minus 8%. Now this is a very relevant situation. It has a lot to do with silicon at room temperature. The band gap of silicon is 1.12 electron volts, and the Fermi energy in an undoped semiconductor is very close to halfway between the conduction band and the valence band, in other words, the dead center of the gap. And so it's about 6 tenths of an electron volt between the Fermi energy and the conduction band. The conduction band is where the free electron resides. So in other words, if there is an electron available to conduct, it's at least 0.6 electron volts above the Fermi energy. What is the probability that there's an electron 0.6 eV above the Fermi energy? We just did that problem. So it's 10 to the minus 1 part and 10 to the minus 10, or rather 10 to the minus 8 percent. What that comes out to, if you have, say, you know, like Avogadro's number of, of atoms available, you, you do have a lot of electrons still. At 10 to the minus 8 percent probability, it turns out, and we're going to learn how to do this calculation, that in this silicon there are 10 to the 10th electrons in every cubic centimeter. So there are still quite a few electrons. Pure silicon can still do some conducting at room temperature. It's a lot less compared to the 10 to the 23 electrons of copper, but there are conduction electrons in silicon. So the thing to take away from here is the form of the Fermi function, which we're not going to derive in this course. If you take a, an elementary course in statistical mechanics, we, you will see a derivation of the Fermi direct distribution. We're just going to use it, and we're going to use this simplified form of the Boltzmann factor, e to the minus energy minus e Fermi over kT most of the time, because we will work at room temperature in this course. We'll pick up next time with the density of states function.